Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started uh, in about two minutes. Thank you, everyone, for showing up early. Um, we're going to give people just a couple more minutes to log in. I understand there might be an update. Um, I might slow down people a little bit from signing up, uh, but it should just take like 30 seconds. Um, so just hold tight. For those who just joined us, we're going to get started in about a minute or so. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, uh, for this presentation, which promises to be informative uh, and one of those type of sessions that I think people can turn around immediately and um, make uh, uh, put into practice uh, to help support your individual leadership, um, as well as uh, support the movement more broadly. So give us another minute or so and we will get started. All right. Okay, let's uh, let's jump right in here. Again, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for our uh, uh, online uh, presentation. Uh, this is Public Leadership Institute, uh, and uh, Happy New Year to um, those who join um, on a regular basis. Um, and I think it's appropriate to kind of kick this particular session on uh, in a high level conversation. The political dynamic is definitely uh, altered over the last year. And uh, this uh, uh, leadership session, this communication session is um, going to be talking about how to really effectively answer 20 tough questions um, that uh, good progressive leaders are going to, in some way, likely to be confronted in some way or another. Uh, my name is Dave Woodward. I am uh, the Public Leadership Institute's National Network Director. I'm also a county official and a former state legislator, and I get to be have the honor of being your host uh, for today's presentation. Uh, for those who are joining for the first time, we give a little bit of background on PLI, uh, the Public Leadership Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, think tank uh, uh, focused on leadership development and um, bringing public awareness to key issues around equity and justice. Uh, we work with uh, political uh, public leaders around the country to um, to collectively uh, move the needle in advancing the economic and social conditions for all people um, across America. Um, our website, www.publicleadershipinstitute.org, has a host of resources that I encourage you to look up either during this presentation or after. Um, as, and that'd be a go to uh, place to get a lot of the tools that we um, offer and, and promote. Um, we have the progressive agenda. Um, actually, have a, a new version that um, is available online, and we are happy to arrange to have copies distributed to you. Um, outlines model policy, uh, and uh, that you can be leading in your community at the state level. Um, our voice and our values, um, which is going to be very, I mean, very related to uh, the presentation today. Um, with uh, uh, one of the lead authors, Bernie Horn, which I'll introduce in a second, um, that really helps frame the conversation and how um, to uh, to meet uh, uh, voters and people where they are and to effectively communicate what we stand for. 
we have a special project on abortion rights um, and some model uh, policy in advancing uh, reproductive freedom uh, in America at the state and local level. And then our newest publication, uh, Preparing to Win, um, is a guide for leading advocacy campaign to really embrace uh, proactive uh, action and the inside outside strategy. All of these publications are available in PDF form online, and um, many are also available for purchase. If you want a higher copy, and going to Amazon.com. So, uh, just I mean, a little bit of housekeeping before I, I introduce our uh, lead presenter today. Um, uh, again, we these sessions that we find are always more valuable is when we maximize participation from folks like yourself. Uh, who are joining us. Uh, so we really want to bring that participation in as much as possible. We have a variety of ways to do that. If you have audio capability based on where you're joining us and for the future, if you're, I mean, depending on where you're joining us, you can join us um, on um, by computer, laptop, tablet, smartphone, um, a lot of variety of ways to be able to do so. If you do have audio up, I mean, capability, click on the hand icon at any time. And when we pause for questions, we'll get you into the queue and you can ask your questions directly to uh, Bernie and um, the rest of uh, the folks that we have with us. Um, yeah, I realize that people join us uh, in unusual positions. Uh, uh, the best one was on a plane um, uh, one time, and so uh, the best that they could do, and as a passenger, not the pilot, uh, I don't know how they managed to do that, or they were on the runway, I don't know what it was, but uh, you can uh, uh, type questions in, uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll take those questions as they come. And then, of course, my email, dwoodward at publicleadershipinstitute.org. If any time after the course of this presentation you have questions or follow-up, um, happy, please email me, and we'll get that information off to the appropriate person to answer those questions. Today's topic, we talked about how to answer 20 tough questions uh, to lead us in that discussion. Uh, the one one, the, only, the legend, uh, Bernie Horn, who um, is our Senior Director for Policy and Communications uh, with Public Leadership Institute, um, a good friend, uh, mentor, and leader in the progressive movement, is a communication trainer, an author, a lawyer. Uh, and he has held uh, I mean, roles in leadership I mean, across the spectrum, and we're glad to call him one of our own uh, and one of the authors of the, our Voice and Our Values publication. Bernie Horn, thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Dave. And I'm going to kick over control over to you. Very good. Let me just get right there. Perfect. OK, and slide show. And kick us, take, a, take it away. There it is. OK. So welcome to another webinar from Public Leadership Institute. Um, this one's 20 Tough Questions. Um, everything we talk about is available online at publicleadershipinstitute.org. Um, I'll just go over some of our resources. Um, one is the 2018 Progressive Agenda. This is um, 12 different categories of uh, policy where we recommend uh, ideas for progressives to introduce. So. This is like one of the issues, and it's a two-page spread. Everything on the left uh, explains what a, an ideal or a good progressive jurisdiction would be like. And wherever you see the text as read, that is a hyperlink to model legislation. On the right are feature policies for 2018. So in this particular case, there are uh, five separate bills that are recommended as particularly useful for 2018. In, in the case of these five, they're all quite popular and, and would make uh, good politics in the 2018 elections. Uh, another one of our resources that's free online is Voicing Our Values, our message guide. You can also get a, a copy uh, on Amazon. Preparing to Win is our book uh, for successful advocacy to teach an ad advocacy group, um, you know, what are the best ways to um, carry out a, a campaign. And our special project on abortion rights, the Playbook for Abortion Rights has 29 model bills on a wide variety of abortion rights topics. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a quick version of our basic strategies in voicing our values. Some of you may have heard these before, uh, but I, I think we need to go over them because um, you have to understand them in order to understand why you should answer questions in a certain way. So I'll go over the basic strategies of voicing our values, message framing, and then we'll go one by one into 20 pretty tough questions and what are your best shots for answering them. So politics is the art of persuasion. For most of the 20th century, political scientists thought that um, economics and philosophy and political science were uh, based on people making rational decisions. But more recently, uh, academics of all kinds have realized that people are really quite irrational and they make their decisions very irrationally. And this is an excellent book by a um, Nobel Prize winning scientist that explains dozens and dozens of uh, ways that cognitive biases are skewed. Um, but there's one particular cognitive bias that's important to understand for politics, and that's what I want to focus on. It's called confirmation bias. Um, this is when people seek out information that conforms to what they already believe, um, while inside their minds they ignore or refute information that disproves these assumptions. It's a selective use of evidence where people reinforce to themselves what they already believe or what they want to believe. It, it's a kind of a self-delusion. And I um, put uh, this picture of Sir Francis Bacon up there because um, this is one of the oldest known and best proven cognitive biases. Sir Francis Bacon explained it 400 years ago, uh, and it's just accepted science today. If a person believes something, let's say they believe that violent crime keeps increasing, you know, even though that's just completely and utterly false, what that person is going to do is they're going to retain the information that they see on Fox, for example, and disbelieve or ignore uh, real, uh, you know, studies that show that the crime rates have declined for decades. Um, in short, when faced with facts that can contradict strongly held beliefs, people will almost always reject the facts and hold on to their beliefs. So if you present evidence or use language that seems to challenge your listeners' key beliefs, you can't persuade them by going right after them. They'll just stop listening. Uh, if, if they think that you're saying you are wrong, then a switch clicks in their brains that essentially turns off rational consideration and turns on negative emotions. Um, people's brains work this way because of um, our the way people evolved. Um, we have two systems in the brain uh, called the system one and system two, where system one is the fast system that reacts instantaneously um, so that uh, it's, it's reflexes and emotions, and it's intuitive, and it's subconscious. System two is the slow system, which is the deliberate system where people are really thinking, and uh, they've got um, real memories and facts and events. Um, system one, the reaction, uh, occurs in milliseconds, while system two is much slower. So when somebody hears something that they really want to disagree with, where emotionally they make them react negatively, um, system one, the fast system, overrides system two. They don't even get to the point of rational thinking. System one, their reflex, has already decided that... Um, you know, that they're, they're against you. It's, it's the fight or flight reflex that's working against you when you're trying to persuade those people. And so you're triggering these negative emotions. Um, just imagine um, you're talking about voter fraud and you're telling your cracked, crank, cranky <laughs> Uncle Mort that, um, you know, voter fraud is virtually uh, unknown. Uh, it's, it's non-existent. Um, and even though that's perfectly true, um, he's going to react negatively. His uh, system one is going to kick in. He's going to think of all the stuff that has been fed to him 
uh, by Fox News that proves, quote, proves, unquote, that voter fraud is common. And, you know, your persuasion effort is just completely uh, wasted. Um, you know, we, we in politics, at least <laughs> the people on the left in politics, we wish that we could reason with people and have calm and, you know, rational fact-based discussions about public policy. But, you know, politics is about persuasion and we tend to trigger our listeners' negative emotional responses and fail to persuade. So I'm not, I'm not going to go into this much, but you, you can read this great book by Drew Weston where he conducted experiments in the 20, 2004 election um, where people were in functional MRI machines and he watched what happened when they got various kinds of information. What he found was that not only did people react um, with that cognitive bias that um, made them hang on to their own beliefs no matter what. No matter, in addition to that, watching in the MRI, he could see that when people defended their false facts, they got a hit of dopamine in the brain so that they felt good about it. So that, you know, what, what really happened was that by forcing somebody to defend their false beliefs made them feel good and actually made it more likely for them to hold on to the belief because of that good feeling that they, that they got. So, you know, avid partisans are very much invested in their pre-existing beliefs and they're very hard to persuade. I mean, an election is really about turnout and persuasion of a narrow group because the overwhelming number of people in the other base are not persuadable. They just aren't. But the interesting thing about persuadable voters is in this chart, um, it's not that persuadable voters are moderates. There's really no such thing as a moderate anymore. Uh, a persuadable voter is someone who has both um, progressive ideas and conservative ideas inside their mind at the same time, and they can accept either one if you frame the conversation using your progressive values, you can grab those persuadables, even though they could also be framed in conservative ways and be grabbed by the other side. It's a question of framing. But the other thing about persuadables is that the intensity of their beliefs is so much lower than the people in the base so that they don't hold on to their beliefs with that 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 furor that that tremendous emotional feeling they're much more persuadable not both because they have the ideas uh, of both the red and blue philosophies in their minds but also because they care less this is a an advantage for us they care less the confirmation bias is not as strong with them. So how do you deal with confirmation bias? How do you persuade? I'm gonna give you three, re three um, rules that we will try to apply when we're talking about these 20 um, tough questions. The first rule is begin in agreement and to the extent possible, stay in agreement. Um, this is an old idea. Um, here, this is 70, 80 years ago, where Dale Carnegie explained that what you're trying to do is to show someone that you are in agreement with them and keep agreeing and show that even if you have different ideas of how to get to some goal, that you share the goal. If they understand that you share the goal, there are far more likely to uh, uh, let you go with it, to agree with you, to accept your position, because they're in agreement with you on the goal. And we are in agreement with um, persuadable voters on the goal. Um, here's just a few examples, You're talking about taxes. So how do you start out an agreement? Well, one way would be to say our tax system is unfair. 
Now, I'm not suggesting these are the only ways to start an agreement. They're just examples. But we believe the tax system is unfair. The federal, state, and local tax systems are almost inevitably um, uh, rigged to benefit the rich over average people. So when you start out with our system, our tax system is unfair, virtually everybody except uh, the top 1% are in agree with, agreement with you. And then you can show them how you, would, how you would change the system to make it fair. And that's, that's where they're going to agree with progressives or budgets. You know, we need to be careful with taxpayer money. That's not a conservative thing to say. Progressives want to spend taxpayer money effectively. And we need to get that across so that people will understand that we're on their side. Or you're talking about crime. You don't want to talk about, you know, oh, you're perfectly safe. If someone wants to talk about crime, they obviously don't think they're safe. Personal safety is a top priority for government. Well, of course it is. We believe that. Of course it is. Just make it clear to the person you're talking to that you're on their side. Or somebody says, you know, our neighborhood is going to the dogs. Um, and you look around and say, gee, this is a nice neighborhood I walked in all day. You, you say instead, we need to preserve the quality of life in our neighborhoods, <laughs> which obviously you believe. You just find some way to agree either um, either uh, with a fact or, or with a goal um, and, um, and pull someone in your direction from there. Political persuasion is not about changing someone's mind. As I explained, you really can't change someone's mind. I mean, it would take uh, either 10 years of you know, massive, um, massive information or it would take something like 9-11, some enormously dramatic thing to change people's minds. So in a campaign, whether it's a legislative campaign or a political campaign, you're not trying to change someone's mind. You're trying to make them understand that they agree with you already. That is persuasion. And you can do this because they do agree with you. They just have assumptions and biases and stereotypes in their minds about progressives that make them think that they don't agree with you. So you have to show them that they do agree with you and pull them to our side um, on a, any number of issues. The second rule is to use values. I'm, I'm going to go into this very little because we talk about this quite a bit in our book, Voicing Our Values, and you, you should just read it. It's, it's a quick read. Um, but basically, there are private values apply to an individual like these, and there are public values like these. When you use public values to talk about your position um, on any issue, you're in agreement because these words are all good, uh, popular ideas. There's nobody who's against any of these things, um, or at least <laughs> nobody who's persuadable is against any of these things. If you show that what you're trying to do is to defend liberty or to protect privacy or to make our system fairer, or to improve um, you know, fundamental justice, then people understand that you're on their side because they understand that those are goals that are good and they agree with you that we should be pursuing those goals. Now, um, as, as the book explains in much more detail, and I'll just go over it very quickly, there are three situations. You can use values in a very specific way that makes you understand which values apply to which situation, where government has no proper role, where the government acts as a referee, or the government acts as a protector. Every, every piece of legislation, every policy fits into one of these three, where, where it's a question of um, the government has no proper role, the government should stay out, the value is freedom. Um, where the issue is that uh, government should 
act as a referee between private unequal interests, the progressive policy is opportunity. And that's virtually everything having to do with the economy is within the opportunity uh, types of values. And where um, government acts to protect those who can't reasonably protect themselves, um, you know, children, seniors, um, you know, the, the people who qualified for CHIP, for example, um, people in future generations that the value is security. Um, freedom, opportunity, and security are, are not original ideas. Um, you may recognize this, this picture. Um, I think the greatest American values of all time are illustrated by this picture, and you all are totally uh, familiar with the line. Thomas Jefferson wrote, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. In the Declaration of Independence, life meant the same as security. Liberty meant the same as freedom. And his pursuit of happiness really meant opportunity. So you can say, and again, that's explained a lot better in the book, that you support freedom, opportunity, and security for all. And that's really the difference between progressives and conservatives. Yeah. They favor freedom, opportunity, and security, but they don't favor it for all. They only favor it for some, mostly the rich. We're the only ones who favor providing these values, these guarantees, these kinds of policies to everyone. And that's always going to put you on the side of your listener because you're including them. They're the ones that are going to benefit from freedom, opportunity, and security for all. Now, you can't just say those three words. And again, in the book, it has these three, this family of values so that you don't have to say freedom. There are a number of other words and phrases that mean the same thing or opportunity. You can say fair share or level playing field for security. You could say safety or protection or quality of life. Um, but those are all words that people agree with. You can persuade people by showing that what you're trying to do fits into these goals that people already agree with. They favor these values. Uh, just three quick examples. You know, you're addressing prejudice and you say what makes America special is its commitment to freedom and justice for all. So that, you know, you're pushing back against hate with classic American values, or talking about wages, America should be a land of opportunity where hard work is rewarded. Um, nobody can really argue with that. That is our ideal of America. You're just showing that what you're proposing is consistent with the values that they already have in their heads, or crime. Our policy reduces the number of repeat offenders, which makes us all safer. You know, that describes virtually every progressive criminal justice measure is that it reduces the number of repeat offenders, which makes, makes us all safer. But one of our problems as progressives is that we talk about crime and how it benefits the offender, or at least it's perceived that way. We don't make it clear that what we're doing is the person that you're talking to, the person you're trying to persuade, is going to benefit from our progressive policy. And that leads us right to the third rule, which is show, show your audience, the people that you're trying to persuade, show them that they directly benefit um, from you know, what we're, we're trying to accomplish. Progressives, well, we wish that the majority of Americans were persuaded as we are by appeals to the, the common good, you know, that they're civic minded, but they're not. They just aren't. Our base is, but outside our base, they are not. It's quite difficult to convince average citizens uh, to support a policy that appears to benefit certain people, you know, a special benefit when 
uh, it's fairly simple to persuade them by showing that they personally benefit or their friends or their community or their family, um, even if that benefit is indirect. And that's, that's what we can do and need to do. Uh, we need to show that we're on their side by not talking about policies that benefit them, the them meaning some group out there that's neither, uh, the, it, who's not the person you're talking to or the people that that person really cares about. Um, you're trying to be inclusive. You're trying to hug them. For example, minimum wage. It's not really about the people who are going to get the increase in the minimum wage. That's not the persuadable voters. Show them that the increase in the minimum wage helps them too. It generates business for the local economy, eases the burden on taxpayer-funded services. It helps build an economy that works for everyone. People accept that. They understand that. They believe that. It works. Or education. We need public schools for our families and our communities that provide each and every child the opportunity to reach their, their fullest pr pr potential in life. In other words, it's not about those kids off somewhere in some inner city which the persuadable voter don't, doesn't know and doesn't all care about all that much. It's about their kids. It's about their neighbor kids. It's about their nieces and nephews and grandchildren and so forth. And our policies do um, affect them. That's the way to persuade. So it all comes down to this. I'm on your side. You, that's, that's politics. It's if you can show people that you're on their side and the other side's not on their side, then you've won. Now I'm going to very quickly take questions about this, and then we will, um, I'll make one other point and then jump to the 20 questions. And you can either um, raise your hand on the, Yep. Or you raise your hand or type questions. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was on mute and go into the conversation. Realized that no one could hear me. Uh, yes, yeah, as Bernie was saying, that I mean, I mean, jump right in here. This is the general framework that we're going to get into the the meat and and talking about uh, talk about these questions, apply these strategies. Um, we did have a question that came through. Um, this was a clarifying. I didn't want to type the title in. Um, what was the first book, Bernie, that you mentioned? Like in the presentation, we have someone who asked what the first book was. Oh, uh, it was the Progressive Agenda. So that's our our book oh, of okay. that's policies. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. I I I'm I was trying. I get confused for a second. Yes. No. The yeah. Um. Twenty eighteen. If you go to uh, our Progressive Agenda. Yes. If you go to our website, you'll see tabs for the Progressive Agenda, Voicing Our Values, Preparing to Win, and the Abortion, the Playbook for Abortion Rights. And I will make sure that that link's available in just a moment, too, um, for folks who are joining us. Um, do, are there any other questions as it relates to anything that's been set up? Um, uh, as Bernie set up the conversation so far? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it is uh, a, a tactic that working with progressive leaders uh, at the state and local level around the country that are put into practice. This is also one of the things that evolves and becomes more effective the more people put into practice and um, and then sharing back that information. And so that's definitely one thing we would like to continue this conversation beyond this presentation um, to make certain that you share um, what's working, what works really well, what, I mean, what grabs, I mean, people's engagement. And I think the, the, the three steps that Bernie laid out are again, pretty simple. And I think maybe then we should just move on to the next uh, phase here. But if you do have any questions coming up and any of the things that's being talked about, please jump in. Don't, uh, don't, don't sit by the sidelines, raise your hand, type your question to the question bar and we'll take them up um, as it's happened. So Bernie, why don't we uh, um, jump into the next, uh, next slides? Very good. Uh, I'm going to just skip over a couple of these slides just to make this point. There's just one other point I want you to understand before we jump to the questions, and that is that um, economically people are pretty miserable. Uh, whenever you read in the newspaper that the economy's good and the economic indicators are good and so forth, that's not how people actually feel. 
they feel, generally speaking, the people who are persuadable, they feel miserable and they have good reason to feel miserable. It's because over time, the economy has been rigged against them. So they don't have as much money, they don't have as much income, they don't have as much pension security, they have good reason to be very upset about their economic situation. And the uh, Trump campaign, you know, jumped in and essentially told people, or told conservative voters at least, uh, the people to blame are quite simply people of color. You know, he, he vocally attacked Latinos and Muslims, and he more subtly attacked African Americans than anybody else who isn't white. Um, and, and this is just a way of expressing the right-wing narrative of grievance against non-whites that's been repeated for decades and which increased in volume tremendously during the <laughs> presidency of Barack Obama. Um, but th there's a reason for this. There's, there's some science behind it that you should understand. Um, and it's, it's called social identity. So psychology tells us that a great deal of an average person's self-image comes from their social identity, the group or groups that they see themselves as a part of. So social identity divides the world into us and them, or the in-group and the out-group, and the us can be something as relatively trivial as which football team a person supports. Maybe, maybe you don't think that's trivial. Um, or it can be about an individual's social class or their family or college or their country. You know, like my college is great and I've got a rival against that college. Um, being part of a group makes people feel good inside. They they emotionally feel good. It enhances pride and self-esteem, and there is usually nothing wrong with that. But people also enhance their self-image by denigrating the other side. Like the subjects uh, in the Drew Weston um, uh, experiment that I, that I was talking about, um, people can get a rush um, of dopamine in their brains by being prejudiced against the other side, by, by speaking out against the other social group that they feel that they're against. And, um, you know, Donald Trump himself seems to quite enjoy it when he is a bigot. Uh, he gets a rush, I really think. So, um, you know, the problem is that people need to feel that they're part of a, a group. And the question is whether they're going to um, use that against us or stand with us. And we need to tell a story where they feel like they're on our side. And I'll just leave that there. I just want you to understand social identity. So right. let's jump right into the 20 tough questions. Here's the first well, actually, one. Before you jump in there, uh, yep, Bernie, yep. I got a question for Bob. It's like, I, how to agree that um, around the school voucher issue, which I think is actually one of the questions that you have, isn't it? One of the 20? Um, I think it might be. Uh -huh. yeah, one it is. Okay. So, uh, so Bob, we're going to hold off on your question. We'll come back to it. If, um, if we don't get to it, we'll make it the 21st. All right. Yep. In fact, it's the third one. So we'll get got to it in just a minute. So let's start with abortion. Um, understand that um, what I'm doing here is I'm uh, stating these questions uh, in a relatively hostile point of view. So the questioner is um, actually hostile, or maybe they're just curious. And uh, your best answer, as always, uh, is to find some point of agreement and move from there. So has anybody got any, any thoughts about abortion? And you know, you just raise your hand or, or write in ideas about how you answer this kind of question. And I'll just keep talking a little bit about your options. But what I'd really like is for somebody to volunteer to answer this question. And we can see, you know, how you're, how you would answer it normally. Um, so again, you can type in questions or raise your hand if you want to really jump into this conversation. Um, The thing about abortion is that there is quite a number of ways 
that you can approach this. Quite a number. Um, and in um, Voicing Our Values, there's four proposed answers, and they all work. I'm just going to make the assumption that people's fingers are slow on the trigger. Um, but maybe talk people, what, like, why don't you give us a tee up of like what the order of questions are? Um, and then people can start thinking about them as well. So okay. That we can, um, um, I'll, first I'll give then. you the, the first five to think about. Uh, after abortion, we have, um, we have uh, same-sex marriage uh, or, or uh, special rights to gay people, really, is, is how uh, a hostile question would ask it. Um, that, that, um, that, yeah, that, that gay people are getting special rights, and that's wrong. Uh, the third one is about vouchers. Um, the fourth one is about aren't public employees uh, getting paid too much and having too many benefits and a lot more than I am. And the fifth one's gun control. That that should right. be fairly controversial. I'll keep people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll go into this one, but keep thinking of the others because we're going to get to it. Basically... Right. Um, well, uh, well, how about this? I mean, so constantly throughout this um, question... Um, like, I think this is a very personal issue and it should be decided between a woman and her doctor, which is not an unfamiliar way that we hear it talked about. Why don't I mean, take that and kind of lead into uh, a, a response, like really putting the three uh, steps into practice. So what was your, what was the first sentence that you used? Um, the question, uh, the, the statement that I think this is a very personal issue that should be decided between a woman and her doctor. So... Um, this is a very personal issue, is one really great way to start an agreement. Um, then the percentage of people who are truly anti-abortion in every circumstance is, is less than 30%, um, maybe even less than 20%, and they're not persuadable. So anybody that you're trying to persuade anybody who has a chance of being persuaded is going to agree with you if you start out with you know this is a very personal issue you know this is a very personal matter that's one way to start it and then you know the second thing that people pretty much that whole 70 percent or so believe is that you know, politicians shouldn't be making the decision for women. They should stay out. Although it's not commonly used, the word freedom is perfect here. You know, this is a question of constitutional freedom. People, sh government shouldn't go there. This is something that individuals should make the decision. Part of the problem with abortion is that um, there are so many situations in abortion, and people, when they hear the word abortion, they may be thinking of third-term abortion. They may be thinking of, you know, not the same thing you're thinking of, in which case, um, you know, you may be most specific by simply saying, you know, I support Roe v. Wade. I don't think it should be overturned, which is one way to be very specific about the issue and 70% um, of voters are on your side. The only people who want to overturn Roe v. Wade are essentially people who are not persuadable. I'll give you <clears throat> this language. This is another way um, to start. Abortion's a complex issue for the individuals involved. People like to hear you say something like, you know, well, this is a complex issue because they feel it's a complex issue. They don't, they don't think it's easy. Um, and, and in part, that's because they're thinking of so many different aspects of abortion. Well, maybe it doesn't seem so complex when someone takes um, an abortion pill after, uh, you know, 10 or 12 weeks, but they may not be thinking of that. They may be thinking of a late second trimester or a third trimester abortion, which they perceive to be very messy and uh, painful matter. 
And then the sentence about the politicians. That's why I feel politicians should stay out of the very personal and private decision whether or not to have an abortion. This, anything that's like this, and, and as I said, in Voicing Our Values, there are four different ways to do this. It works. It works for everybody who's persuadable. The people who are not persuaded by this, you're never going to get them anyway. Also, I wouldn't dilly dally. If you're, let's say you're an elected official and you're trying to answer this in a town meeting or, you know, you're walking door to door, um, people have in their minds an expected answer. So I wouldn't dilly dally over it. There's no real advantage to making this a long, drawn out um, discussion about abortion. Um, they want to hear you're on one side or the other. Should I go to the next? Yes. Okay. So the next is, should we give special rights to gay people? And that's how, you know, people are thinking about um, ENDA, uh, uh, you know, preventing discrimination in employment and housing and so forth, um, which um, most states do not provide um, protections against discrimination. And, you know, as we see uh, almost every day, there's some story about some baker who doesn't want to make a, a cake for a same-sex couple. So how do you do this? What is it? How, how can you agree? I mean, Linda makes the, I mean, the question and the comment that everyone should be treated equally as a as a way of starting an agreement absolutely i think that's that is great and and i'd i'd might um you know hang a few ornaments on it about you know in in america you know it, it's it's fundamental that everybody's treated equally or you know it's it's uh, it's one of our most cherished values that we treat everyone equally. Or, you know, America was founded on the idea of um, treating people equally. Something like that. Absolutely. And then where would you go with it? I guess I'm waiting for Linda to type. <laughs> <laughs> You know, sometimes there's a delay here. We'll ensure so, that we can get through. Maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe we should just like move on. Linda, feel free okay. to, uh, I mean, follow up there. I just want to make sure that we can get through all yep. of these in the time. Okay. Line. Let me, let me give you a model uh, that's invoicing our values. Um, and this is one way to say what Linda said. If America stands for anything, it's equal opportunity for all. So to really make it, you know, a, a pro-America kind of statement. And then, you know, this is just a kind of a personal way of doing it. If you have two children or grandchildren, one is straight and the other is gay, you still love them equally. You know the government should treat them fairly and equally. So LGBTQ people should be treated like everybody else. And the law should ensure that they're not victims of discrimination just because of who they are. Um, there's some advantage to be talking about love. Um, you still love them equally. Uh, and there's um, some advantage of trying to turn this from they're getting special rights to they're being treated like everybody else. The other side wants to say, well, to create and anti-discrimination laws to give special rights to uh, gay people. And you're trying to tr turn it to, no, what we're trying to do is to make sure that they're treated like everybody else. So here's the third one. We were, gave you warning. Opportunity scholarships is the, <laughs> it's the right wing way of saying vouchers, school right. vouchers. And Betsy DeVos's dream yep. to dismantle public education in America. 
So, I mean, Bob, earlier I posed the question, is, I mean, and this is kind of me posing the mm -hmm. question, and I, I'll throw it back at Bob um, to maybe make, um, write some suggestions, is how do you um, agree that parents have the right to decide the type of education for their children that they receive when it's framed in the terms of school vouchers, how to persuade the privately funded school uh, schools jeopardize equal opportunity for all to get a good education. It seems to come down to the, the fundamental question, like how does it benefit me? And I think you're um, kind of, I mean, really, we've got to find like, what's that, what's that uh, initial center space of agreement to start a conversation. Um, and again, like with all of these, if there are people who are overwhelmingly on one side, you're not going to move them. This is, I mean, to a genuine, very small, persuadable audience. What what is a, a, an angle, um, true, time tested way to start that conversation? Now there is polling about this, and um, people pretty heavily oppose school vouchers. Um, and the, the reason why they oppose it is that they don't think that taxpayer dollars should be taken from public schools and given to private schools, which uh, is the case in almost all voucher schemes, except for the one in the District of Columbia, where the Congress has given extra money for the vouchers. So that, that should be a part of your answer. Mm -hmm. So, th thoughts about how to start when you're talking about public education? Okay, I'll, you're I'll all just, out there. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just go. You know, I think that you can be pretty straightforward. You know, we all want what's best for our own children, and that. You know, that's very much uh, in agreement and um, making people think about uh, it's their own benefit that we're talking about. If parents decide private school is best for their child, that's great. But taxpayer dollars should not be taken out of public schools to fund private schools. Boom. You, that sentence, everybody agrees, or not everybody, but the great majority agree with you with that sentence. We need to focus our scarce tax dollars on the goal of having top quality public schools so that each and every child has the opportunity to succeed, achieve, and live the American dream. Uh, I suggest that each and every child is an important thing. There's been too much talk in education policy about averages. The truth of the matter is that persuadable voters don't care about averages. They care about their children their neighbors' children, their nieces and nephews, their grandchildren. And that's what you need to talk to so that um, you're just defending the children that they care about when you're defending the taxpayer dollars and making sure that they go to public schools. Um, the people who are for vouchers because they've got children in private school are not persuadable. I'll go into this next one. So this is a, a base, your basic attack on um, public employees. And there's an awful lot of people out there who currently feel like if somebody's getting a better deal than they are, instead of saying, why aren't I getting that good deal? They say, those people shouldn't get that good deal. Let's take it away from them, which is you know, really serves the rich when people react that way. But that's what's happening on the conservative side. So how do you deal with it? What's the, what's the way to agree? And people can type questions. Uh, I mean, raise your hand, have the conversation. This is, I mean, I mean, this is definitely one of the strategies of the right to um, discredit, call into question, um, uh, attack the, the role of government in our communities. Bernie, we have a quiet bunch today. All right, well, I'll just go in. Um, so here's a way to agree. Our state, city, county, whatever you're talking about, 
shouldn't waste a penny. Now, nobody's going to disagree with you on that. Again, it's not conservative to say that we shouldn't waste a penny. Progressives don't want to waste money. We want to use it effectively. So start an agreement. You know, we don't want to waste a penny. We should pay fair wages and benefits, nothing more and nothing less. And then you can say, you know, based on what I've seen, and then you personalize it. The teachers and police officers and firefighters in our community are not overpaid. Uh, that's based on what I've seen. And if you personalize it to the public employees in their community, they're not going to be against those people. It's, it's some vague enemy out there that they're against. But when you remind them about the people who are in their own community, who are their neighbors, um, they're, they're not going to say to take away wages or benefits from their neighbors. So based on what I've seen, I don't believe that the teachers, police officers, and firefighters in our community are overpaid. Now, you can stop there, or you can use that to pivot and attack the conservatives. But... There are some government contractors with excessive subsidies or sweetheart contracts, and we've got to crack, crack down on those to save taxpayer dollars. So you're saying um, not only uh, are um, the public employees not a problem, but there is a problem that's related, that they're right to be worried about wasted taxpayer dollars, and they're being wasted on these uh, unfair subsidies to big con companies and there's nobody's gonna you know if you put it this way people are going to be on your side they don't want unfair monies going to companies any more than they want unfair monies to be going to anybody else so you start an agreement you're staying in agreement if the person's persuadable it should work okay now, if somebody says, do you favor gun control, they're generally speaking not on your side because our side doesn't say gun control anymore. Our side says, um, you know, gun safety or um, protection. Now, there's a, there's a way to, to agree that may may or may not make you feel bad you may or may not be comfortable saying this but there's a way to agree with about 90 percent of people and i'll go right into it that is to say how about um okay go ahead. Uh, i'm about right about wrote in here uh, i i favor responsible um ownership of guns yeah Right, right. Or in this case, you know, I support the Second Amendment. But something that's favorable to gun ownership, um, you know, it's impractical to be um, against gun ownership. And you can't be very patriotic and say that you're against the Second Amendment. Um, and something like, you know, 90% of Americans are all for the Second Amendment. Um but then you, you you show that you're reasonable, just like most Americans are. Like most Americans, I support a reasonable laws that keep guns out of the hands of convicted felons, domestic abusers, and dangerously mentally ill. Um, the fact is that when you get into an argument over gun laws, that um, the pro-gun side will not talk about the law that is at issue. They will never talk about the law, which is at issue. They will create straw man arguments. They will take you down a different path. They're going to try to argue that the law is going to do something different than it actually does. They're going to say <coughs> that it's going to result in confiscation, that it's going to result in the police coming and getting your gun, or some such thing which is preposterous completely preposterous. So what you want to do is you want to talk about the specific law 
that you're talking about. This particular gun violence protection legislation is just a modest common sense measure to protect our public safety. And when people are polled, if you ask about the specific measure, for example, um, should we have background checks on all guns? Yeah, about 85 to 90% are in favor. If you say, you know, do you favor gun control? It's more like 50-50 because they just don't know what gun control means. The more specific you are, the more you win the argument. And, you know, do everything you can when you're arguing against someone to push away from their their straw man arguments. Say, that's not what we're talking about. That's phony. We're talking about should we sell guns without a background check, yes or no? Because then everybody's on your side. If you make it generally about gun control, that's how the other side wins. So the next five just so you're prepared, it's prayer in schools, then um, basically uh, lock up criminals and throw away the key, then global warming, then uh, drug tests for welfare recipients, and finally illegal immigrants. And that's the first 10. So we better just move along, I guess. Yeah, we should move along if we're going to get through. Yeah, yes. my goodness. <laughs> All right. So look. Prayer in schools, um, the Supreme Court decided this a long, long time ago, but still, if you take a poll, people say that they're in favor of prayer in schools. That's because they have no idea what they're talking about. They don't know what prayer in schools means anymore. I mean, most of them never experienced prayer in schools. It was stopped so long ago. I would support freedom of religion. We're the ones who favor freedom of religion, strangely. We rarely talk about it. We're the ones that favor freedom of religion. Um, and children can freely pray in school right now if it's voluntary, and they always have been able to. The problem is government-sanctioned prayer, government-required prayer, you know, where the teacher tells the children what to say word for word, which was not necessarily your religion. That was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court 60 years ago because it violates our freedom of religion. That's what you want to make people understand. What, what school prayer is, is not children praying because they can do that anytime they want. It's about administrators and principals and teachers telling your children exactly what to say in a prayer. That's school prayer. You should be able to win this argument, even though if people asked in a poll, you know, are you for school prayer? Mm, 60, 70% will say they're for it. But that's because they don't know what you're talking about. Okay, about criminals. Now, this is a, a great issue for progressives, and we don't talk about it very much. You know, we're, we've been scared to death because of everything that's happened over the last 30 years or so. Um, you know, we're still in shock from Michael Dukakis. Um, the important thing when you're talking about criminals is to address your audience about how your progressive law is going to make them safer. That's what it always is the case. I, you know, you don't have to say this if you're not comfortable, but, you know, I think you believe that we should lock up repeat violent offenders because it makes us safer. That's what jail is for. It's for repeat violent offenders. But we're also safer if we prevent juveniles and petty criminals from becoming violent career criminals. You know, we can lower repeat crimes um, by doing this or that. And that makes you and me safer if we can prevent these people from becoming violent criminals down the road your family's safer my family's safer that's what we're trying to accomplish if we can make people understand that you're for their security when it comes to criminal justice then they're on your side 
So don't talk about how it benefits the criminal. That's fine. We we can talk about that among ourselves about how how good it is um, to turn turn somebody's life around. When you're talking to persuadable voters, talk about how that's going to protect them. They're going to be safer. That's persuasion. Global warming. So. Um, if someone asks about global warming, generally speaking, they're against you because our side now says climate change, but not necessarily. They may just think that that's the right way to say it. There's nothing wrong with the term global warming. It's accurate. It's just that climate change is a more of a description because a lot of things are happening because of climate change, not just warming. So a one way to start that's in agreement is we have to protect the health, safety, and security of our children and grandchildren. <coughs> Who could disagree? Um, now, people are believing in climate change now, but there was a study that showed that there is one sentence that actually works better than any other sentence, and that is this one. Over 97% of climate scientists agree that humans are causing climate change. It's generally speaking, facts don't move people, but <clears throat> in this case, saying 97% of climate scientists agree um, makes some difference to people. It's because the other side tries to make it seem like it's there's really a dispute, and there really is no dispute. Um, so we need to apply common sense strategies now uh, common sense, we're always for the common sense. We know how to implement clean energy solutions. We know how that, how <clears throat> we know that reducing fossil fuel dependence will make America stronger and our kids safer. And we need to get it done because our children are counting on it. A little bit complicated, uh, but um, you see that, you know, basically uh, getting people to understand the climate change is real and that we don't have to sit back. We can make a difference. That's what they need to know. Okay, drug tester welfare recipients. This is a very difficult issue. If you take a poll, people are f in favor of it. Um, and um, it's being introduced and, and enacted in the most conservative states. And it's a tough one. So the way to agree with people is to say something like, you know, we should certainly discourage people from taking illegal drugs. Nobody's going to disagree with that, really, or persuadable voters won't disagree. Um, but it's, you know, it's irrelevant to this question. We should discourage people from using illegal drugs, but... We need to do it without wasting a whole lot of taxpayer money. Now, people are very sensitive about taxpayer money. And so if you can show the taxpayer money is being grossly <laughs> wasted, you can get them on your side. The states have tried this policy and found that they spend much more tax money on the testing than they save from cutting people off public assistance. It's a big money loser. And people, people change if you can give them that one fact. When you're arguing with people, you can't give them many facts, but if you got one fact, like the 97% of climate scientists or that states lose a lot of money when they um, adopt this uh, policy, that one fact can make a difference. Um, so let's focus on treatment and prevention programs that work. And the tenth of the 20 is about immigrants. Uh, of course, the other side is going to talk about illegal immigrants, and they focus on the idea that they broke the law, which is a real problem when they talk about DACA, because the, the kids, by definition, didn't break the law. They were carried as infants and um, had, had no part in the decision.
one way to go is to talk about American values. You know, we should be true to American values and protect everyone's right to due process and fair treatment under the Constitution. So you're getting them in a mood to think, okay, well, we have to protect American values. And then immigrants who work hard and play by the rules make our economy and our country stronger. Now, this phrase is very important. Work hard and play by the rules. The And it's a phrase that Bill Clinton used to say, and you don't have to say it quite that way, but the idea to make people understand that the folks we're talking about are law-abiding and productive um, changes how they think about the issue. The other side is trying to frame them as criminals. And if they are framed as criminals successfully, then naturally they deserve punishment, right? If they're criminals, they deserve punishment. But people who work hard and play by the rules they deserve to be supported. So it's important to frame um, the immigrants that we're talking about. Um, further, everyone agrees that it'd be logistically impractical and outrageously expensive to seize and deport millions of people. It's true that that's what people think, uh, but it's good to remind them that it would, it would cost an untold amount of money to accomplish it. And obviously it can't be accomplished. You can't deport 11 million people. Um, and then lay it off on Congress. They're the ones who are to blame here. The solutions for Congress to fix the federal immigration process, creating a roadmap to legal residence and citizenship, which people support. Um, and, you know, who's in charge of Congress? Well, they're the ones who are to blame. Let's talk about evolution. And after evolution, we'll get to the death penalty. Corporations are people, um, energy prices, and um, the construction of mosques. So shouldn't people teach the controversy, which is the way the right wing talks about evolution? Again, I would go with freedom of religion. Um, everybody supports freedom of religion. We have to remind people that freedom of, re of religion is on our side here. The question in a, in a school is, will we teach somebody's religion or will we teach science? Right? So the founders strongly supported freedom of religion because they came here to escape governments that imposed religion on them. So freedom is the very heart of America. Um, virtual all scientists agree that intelligent design is not science, it's religion. So children should learn about it, but in church, not in public school science classes. So you're saying, yeah, they should learn about it. They should listen in church, but that freedom of religion requires that government not be involved in teaching a particular religious point of view. It's hard. I think it works. The death penalty. Now, again, we may oppose, if you oppose the death penalty, you may oppose it for moral reasons, but that's not the way to get persuadable voters. Our system should be focused on making us safer. That's, you're talking to them, their own personal safety. There's not an ounce of evidence. Death penalty deters any crime at all. We shouldn't spend enormous amounts of time and money to implement it. Instead, we should insist that our courts, prosecutors, and police divert all those resources that they're wasting to efforts that actually diminish crime and make you safer and make me safer. Besides, there's so many people who have been sentenced to death who were later proven innocent. That's a tremendous injustice. And it guarantees when the wrong person is sentenced to death, it guarantees that the real murderer remains at large. We need government to spend its time and money on catching the actual criminal and making your family safer and my family safer. That's, that's 
the, the practical way to persuade people about the death penalty. If they think it's morally uh, wrong, they're already on our side. Persuadable people have to be decide, have to be persuaded uh, based on their own personal best interest. Um, our corporations, people. I think this is important for you to understand um, that um, you know the conservatives really want to confuse corporations, corporate rights, and and the rights of individuals, and that we need to divide a line. Yes, corporations should have certain rights to due process. They shouldn't be treated unfairly. But there are certain rights that are fundamental to people. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly that are about people. They're not about corporations. It's wrong. Supreme Court is wrong. It is wrong to talk about a corporation's religion. That is wrong. They don't have a religion. That's Corporations are not people, only people have freedom of religion. We, we're losing that argument because we're not making it. Um, and here's the last set. Um, do environmental legislation lead to higher prices? None of us likes it when prices rise. Yeah. Nobody's going to disagree with you. But I only support new rules that provide more benefit than cost. So you sort of, you sort of hedging or, or changing the question, but sort of not. And then you're getting to the heart of it. Those rules protect something that we all own together: air, water, forest, parks, from abuse by just a few people. It's our, it's our property, and we want to protect it. When they pollute for profit, it's at our joint expense. Um, we need fair and transparent rules to make sure that environmental costs aren't dumped on all of us. And that's that's what an economist would explain. Shouldn't we stop the construction of a mosque in our neighborhood? They're terrorists. Now, this is a very practical argument that's been going on in a lot of places in the United States. It's very sad. But once again, we do a very poor job of explaining how we are the ones who favor freedom of religion. It's not the conservatives, they, they don't at all. We favor freedom of religion. Freedom means the government does not get involved in favor of one religion or another. So you st I would start out by talking about, you know, freedom of religion is fundamental in our country. It is the very most, one of the most important rights um, in the Constitution and in American life. The key to defending freedom is if we deny freedoms to other hardworking, law-abiding people, that's how we lose them ourselves. That's how freedom works. If we're not all free, then none of us is free. That's the truth. In this case, if the town could block construction because it's a mosque, then it can block any other religious group, Mormons or Seventh-day Adventists, or maybe Methodists or Catholics or whatever your own de denomination is. None of us is free unless all of us are free. That's what freedom is, and we have to follow it. Wouldn't it hurt small businesses and cost jobs if we increase the minimum wage? This, again, is a very common argument. Now, in the minimum wage, the, they only have one argument that works. Everything else they say does not work at all. And even this argument doesn't work all that well. But the only thing that works even at all is about small businesses. They're concerned about small, they, they talk about being concerned with small businesses. Of course, they're not. And we have to address that. Our economy depends on small businesses. We have to encourage them. But all the evidence shows that increasing the minimum wage puts money in the pockets of people who will spend it almost immediately. And that quickly generates business in our local economy. The small businesses benefit from it. If we do it right, raising the minimum wage is a win-win. So that you're supporting the small businesses. Why are you running for office now? Um, you know, Ted Kennedy famously did a very poor job 
answering this question. You always, if you're running for office, you better have an answer. It's got to be like a 15 second answer and you need to be able to repeat it from memory at any moment. Now, this is one that's based on the economy. Our, the economy is terrible. People are hurting. And our state, city, county is not doing enough to solve the real problems, which I think everybody would agree with. I'm running because we can do better. Our system works when everyone gets a fair share, everyone gets a fair shot, everyone gives their fair share, and everyone plays by the same rules. My opponent's policies are not fair. They rig the system to benefit the rich over the rest of us. My policies would ensure that everyone who works hard and plays by the rules has the opportunity to live the American dream. If you can say that, I mean, if that's what your, your candidacy is about, and you can say that, there's nobody that can really disagree with you. And it sets up what's really important about a progressive versus conservative race, and that is that we're on the side of the average person and the other, the conservatives on the side of the rich. Are you a tax and spend liberal? I'm a pragmatic and common sense progressive. I support a balanced budget. I support tax fairness. We need to identify and cut tax breaks and loopholes that benefit the wealthy few at the expense of all the rest of us. Our overall goal should be to maintain and improve the quality of life here in our city, not just for ourselves, but for our children and grandchildren. So you turn this thing on their heads, tax and spend, we're the ones who are for fair taxes. We're the ones for smart spending. You just need to say it in a way that people understand the progressives are on their side. Are you trying to knock down the free enterprise system? No. <laughs> I favor equal opportunity for all. That requires a system with rules of the road that make economic competition fair and open and honest. We need to ensure that everyone gets a fair shot, everyone does their fair share, everyone plays by the same fair rules and has much the same ending there. And this is the last question. And you know, this something like this is common if you're talking about fairness, you know, oh, you're a socialist. And I strongly recommend that you use your values. And I've done this before, um, I've done this on right-wing talk radio, and it works. I'm for freedom, opportunity, and security for all. We call that a progressive. If you say that you're for freedom, opportunity, and security for all, even conservatives will be tongue-tied. They don't know how to answer that. And when they try to answer it, you can come back and say, no, you're for freedom, opportunity, and security for some. Let me give you some examples of where you favor some people over others. It's the progressives that favor it for all. That's what makes us different. That's what we stand for. Those are our values. And they are purely and clearly American values. And that's the 20 questions. You can find them online on our website. Dave, are you on hey, mute? I am. Yep. I, am <laughs> I was like just talking like, oh, um, I had a coffee to attack just a second ago. Uh, so, I mean, we, we talked about 20 issues, whether you're, I mean, selling out, going door to door, I mean, coming to crowds, um, even whether they're hecklers or other people that are confronted at this. I think from the very beginning of the, uh, the conversation that, uh, Bernie laid out a very simple way to structure a response. I think the other I mean, thing I really want to underscore that this is not about changing our beliefs or changing our position. And it's not even so much about spin. It is about how do we present what we care about and what we stand for. Absolutely. Don't change what you favor. What what you would try to do in office, what you would lobby for, what legislation you think um, our government should adopt. Uh, but persuasion is about picking the arguments and the tactics, the, the rhetorical tactics that persuade. 
Exactly. And I mean, Bob written, I wrote up here, and when we were talking about values, I want to, I mean, lift up what the thing he's pointing out. Um, this concept for all matters. That the values that we share um, as being part of this broader community, the part of this movement overall, is the idea of, I mean, of freedom, opportunity, and equality for all. And we are up against. Um, a political force that doesn't necessarily disagree with all of those intended um, outright, but they believe in that for a few and for some. And it is probably the, arguably the most striking contrast between what we stand for and what they stand for. And we've got to get very comfortable being able to I mean, take by take back words and terms that have been co-opted um, and presented in a way that Again, we start off the conversation with the persuadable audience with people overwhelmingly in agreement with the things that we're fighting for. And we've got we can't we can't shy away from it. We've got to be bold. We've got to be aspirational. And I think the uh, the framework that Bernie outlined is incredibly useful. And I put it into practice in uh, my own workings outside of my I mean, my work with PLI. And I think it's um, and and I really it kind of like my ask as we close out the session for all of you who've uh, joined us over the course of this presentation is put it into practice. Um, circle back with myself and Bernie to, to um, and, and share what works very well, um, what uh, you felt didn't work as well, and could can we can we work it? I mean to be uh, to be stronger. This is gonna. Uh, we need we need to do this uh, more often if we want to ensure um, to ensure uh, effectiveness in being better communicators of what we stand for. As we close out, any other questions? I guess I'll just say pose one question, um, Bernie, to you uh, while we round this out. Why do you think it is, uh, I mean, a, as a movement, our progressive political leaders, I think at the national scale, just so that we're talking about people who are doing this, like why aren't we seeing, I, I would say, that like this uh, effective way of communicating more often from our political leaders? Um, well, I think that our political leaders tend to be talking to um, other Democrats um, a lot more than they're talking to persuadable voters and that they confuse how to talk. You know, they they use language that is really intended for our base when they're talking to people who are persuadable. Um, they also tend to get involved in um, insider language um, and, and talk about, you know, filibusters and cloture and use abbreviations and, you know, other things that average people don't understand, um, even though you'd think they should. Right. I mean, they, they, they start talking like a politician that people are like, yeah, you're just like all the others. Um, then using real language and communication tactics that whether you're talking about someone in sales or marketing. Um, when I've, I mean, when I've make, shared this book with someone recently who um, is in auto, I mean, auto supplier sales, um, big progressive. Uh, I mean, she was able to bring the connection directly into, the, I mean, to her work and, and confirmed that this is a winning strategy to engage people um, and to move them uh, in a direction that, um, well, best case scenario comes with you. Worst case scenario um, uh, mitigates the conflict. Um, so it is... Uh, um, Thank you. Thank you very much again for, for being with us. Thank you for all of our participants around the country uh, joining us for another uh, webinar around this topic. Um, all the stuff, frankly, that I mean, Bernie was talking about, again, um, can be uh, uh, 
uh, referenced again by going to our website, www.publicleadershipinstitute.org, uh, and download a PDF version of Voice in Our Values, or if you would like a hard copy, go to Amazon.com and uh, select it. Um, we'd love to get a copy, a uh, hard copy in your hands if that's a, a more useful tool. So. Without any further ado, thank you very much. Please join us again, uh, generally every couple weeks, same time, same place. Um, and uh, please spread the word. Um, spread the word about this resource. Invite friends to participate. Uh, if you have any additional feedback, please uh, reach out to me or Bernie. And um, we look forward to, to working with you as we uh, hopefully go into 2018 with a stronger, more effective message strategy to define and talk about what we stand for. Thanks again, Bernie. Thank you, Dave.